G'day guys, today I want to talk about the Anglo-Saxon uprising in response to the Norman conquest of England. That's coming up. So what we know is the Anglo-Saxon army fell at Hastings with the death of King Harold. The Normans then went forward to London and laid siege. This siege went on for a little while. We don't know a whole lot about it. There's a lot that's been lost in history. In the months after the, the conquest, small uprisings began all over the country. I think a lot of this comes down to Mercia and Northumbria not taking part in Hastings as such. We do know Harold Godwinson had petitioned them to send their fjords to the south to meet the Norman conquest. We also know that a substantial number of men had left London on the day of the battle. We don't know if they arrived. I suspect they in fact didn't. What happened to them? We don't know. We'll talk about that in a different video. But Today I really want to focus on the uprisings. So let's take a little bit of a look at what happened there. There seems to have been a great deal of confusion within the aristocracy at the time. Many nobles had surrendered to the Normans. A large portion of the Hiscals that survived uh, and the local fjords uh, I guess could see what was happening and where the country was going to go and various sorts of resistance bands began to form. William the Conqueror left control of England in the hands of his half-brother Odo as well as one of his closest supporters William Fitzobin. In 1067, rebels in Kent launched an unsuccessful attack on Dover Castle in, the combination, in combination with Eustace II of Boulogne. The Shropshire landowner Edric the Wild, in alliance with the Welsh ruler Gwynedd of Powles, raised a revolt in Western Mercia, fighting Norman forces based uh, primarily in Hereford. These events forced William to return uh, towards the end of 1067. In 1068, William besieged the rebels in Exeter, that is in the southwest of, the, of England, including Harold's mother, Githa, and surviving heavy losses managed to negotiate the town's surrender. In May, William's wife, Matilda, was crowned queen at Westminster. Now, this would have been highly, highly, highly symbolic. Not only is William saying, I'm the conqueror of England, he's now saying he's the ruler. Later in the year, Edwin and Morcar raised revolts in Mercia with Welsh assistance, while Gospatric, the newly appointed Earl of uh, Northumbria, led an uprising in Northumbria as well, which had not yet been fully occupied by the Normans. These rebellions, however, fairly quickly collapsed. Now you have to remember the Anglo-Saxon fjords were not designed for protracted campaigns. They were simply designed for short campaigns that would last around about a month, including um, really travel to and from the battlefields. So when the fjords were expected to be able to spend, or when the, these rebellions were expected to spend months and perhaps longer, in the field at a time, uh, a lot of these people simply couldn't sustain it because they had crops to harvest, they had goods to make, and so on. William the Conqueror also embarks on a massive campaign of building castles, fortifications, garrisons. 
He also built a lot of um, buildings for the English church. Edwin and Morcar again submitted to Norman control, while Gospatrick fled to Scotland, as did Edgar the Atheling and his family. We'll come back to Edgar the Atheling in a different video. Edgar the Atheling does seem to have been directly involved in these re revolts. Meanwhile, Harold's sons, who had taken refuge in Ireland, raided Somerset and Cornwall. Early 1069, the newly installed Earl of Northumbria, Robert de Cummies, and several hundred soldiers accompanying him were massacred at Durham. The Northumbrian rebellion was joined by Ed Edgar Gospatrick, Seward Barn, and other rebel rebels who'd taken refuge in Scotland. The Castellan of York, Robert Fitzga uh, Fitzrichard, was defeated and killed, and the rebels besieged the Norman castle at York. William the Conqueror hurried north with an army and defeated the rebels outside York and pursued them into the city, massacring the inhabitants and bringing the revolt to an end. He built a second castle in York. He strengthened the Norman garrison in Northumbria and returned south. A subsequent local uprising was crushed by the garrison at York. Harold's sons launched a second raid from Ireland and were defeated in Devon by Norman forces under Count Brian and his sons, Eudes, Count of uh, Penthrive. In August or September 1069, a large feet, fleet sent by Sven II of Denmark arrived off the coast of England, sparking a new wave of rebellions across the country. After abortive raids in the south, the Danes joined forces with the Northumbrians, which also was joined by Edgar, Gothpatrick, and other exiles from Scotland, as well as Wolfwolf. The combined uh, Danish and English forces defeated the northern garrison, that is the northern Norman garrison at York. Several castles were seized and the rebels took control of Northumbria and also started to raid into Lincolnshire, led by uh, Edgar, who was defeated shortly afterwards by the northern Norman garrison of Lincoln. At the same time, resistance flared up in Western Mercia, where forces of Edric the Wild, together with his Welsh allies, and further rebel forces from Cheshire and Shropshire attacked castles, particularly Shrewsbury. In the southwest, rebels from Devon and Cornwall attacked the northern garrison of Exeter, but were repulsed and by the defenders and scattered by the Norman relief force under Count Brian. Other rebels from Dorset, Somerset and neighbouring areas besieged Monticlue Castle but were defeated by a Norman garrison gathered from London, Winchester and Salisbury under Geoffrey of Contiers. Meanwhile, William the Conqueror attacked the Danes who had moored for the winter south of the Humber in Lincolnshire and drove them back to the north bank, leaving Robert of Mortain in charge of Lincolnshire. William turns west and defeated the Mercian rebels in the battle at Stafford. When the Danes attempted to return to Lincolnshire, the Norman forces there again drove them back across the Humber River. William advances into Northumbria, defeating uh, an attempt to block his forces crossing the swollen river. Defeating an attempt by the rebels to block the Normans from crossing the river Aire at Pontefract. The Danes fled at his approach and William occupies York. He, brought, he brought off the Danes who agreed to leave England in the spring during the winter of 1069 and 1070. The Norman forces systematically de then devastate Northumbria in the famed harrying of the north, subduing all resistance. As a symbol of his renewed authority over the north, 
William ceremoniously wore his crown at York on Christmas Day whilst feasting. It's important to note at this point, at this time, William, who was feasting away, was surrounded by thousands of Anglo-Saxons all pleading for food because they were starving. We're going to deal with the Harring of the North in a separate video because it deserves one. It's important to understand that the book called the Doomsday Book, which was written by the Normans, states that over 100,000 Anglo-Saxons, men, women and children, were killed or starved to death as a result of the harrowing of the North. That is a phenomenal number and could potentially have represented around about a third or a quarter of the Anglo-Saxon population at the time. We don't know exact numbers, it's not fair to say exact numbers, um, and there's no real evidence, but it's important to understand that the Doomsday Book was written by the Normans, so that's their account, that's their admission of what they've done. I've heard some historians question the number and can't understand how a number that big could be achieved. Uh, it is fairly simple. It's winter, nothing's growing, and the Normans destroyed all the food, destroyed all the shelter, all the housing, and slaughtered all the animals. So if you've got nothing to eat, then hundreds of thousands of people will die. Um, it's also important to understand that many Anglo-Saxons fled into continental Europe, but as I say, we'll deal with the Harring of the North separately. In early 1070, having secured the submission of Walling, Walford um, and Gospatrick and driven Edgar and his remaining supporters back to Scotland, William the Conqueror returns to Mercia where he based himself at Chester and crushed all remaining resistance in the area before returning to the south. Papal legates arrived and at Easter recrowned William which would have been symbolically reasserting his right to the kingdom. William also oversaw a purge of pretates from the church, most notably Stigard, who was deposed from Canterbury. The Pope legates also imposed penances on William. So what that's basically saying is that uh, Saxons not only were convicted under Norman law, but they were convicted under church law. So separate laws, even for the same crime, meant separate punishments. And the penance for William meant that uh, the Anglo-Saxons were having to pay an additional tax, basically. So anyone who had taken part in Hastings or been accused of taking part in Hastings fell into that category and any of the subsequent campaigns or rebellions. As well as Canterbury, the See of York had become uh, vacant, that's a church position, following the death of Ethelred in September 1069. Both sees were filled by men loyal to William, not surprising. Lanfrac, abbot of William's found, foundation at Caen, received the Archbishop of Canterbury, whilst Thomas de Bayeux, one of William's chaplains was installed at York. Right, okay, let's move on. So we then have a series of problems with the Danes, or at least uh, Normans do. In 1070, Sven II of Denmark arrived to take personal command of his fleet and renounced the early agreement to withdraw his troops. Uh, and renounces any agreement he had earlier with William and he sends his troops into the Fens who were joined by English rebels including Herald the Wake. At that time, who was based in Eli, that's the island of Eli, Sven soon accepts further payments of Danegold from William the Conqueror and returns home. However, after his departure, from the Fenland, rebels remained at large, protected by the marshes and the geography and the, and the terrain. 
and in early 1071 there was a final outbreak of resistance. Edwin and Morcar again turned against William, and although Edwin was quickly betrayed and killed by his own supporters, Morcar reaches Eli, where he and Herwald were joined by exiled rebels who had sailed in from Scotland. William the Conqueror arrives with a substantial army and a fleet to finish off this last pocket of resistance. After some costly failures, the Normans managed to construct a pontoon and reach Eli. Defeated, the rebels at the bridgehead and stormed the island, making an effective end to English resistance. Morcar was imprisoned and the fate of Herwald was left to speculation. We don't honestly know what happened to Herwald. He may have been uh, pardoned, he may have been uh, imprisoned or slaughtered. There are some people who believe that he was killed by Norman knights and his body thrown into the forest. Interestingly, and we don't know much of the detail, but in 1071, William faced further difficulties, um, but in 1072, he returns to England and marched. In 1071, William faces difficulties in continental Europe. But by 1072, He's returned to England and marched north to confront King Malcolm III of Scotland. The campaign, which included a land army supported by a substantial fleet, resulted in the Treaty of Abernathy, in which Malcolm expelled Edgar the Atheling from Scotland and agreed to pay some degree of subordination to William the Conqueror. The exact status of the subordination is unclear, and the treaty merely states that Malcolm essentially becomes William's man. And we don't quite know exactly what that means. In 1075, during William's absence, Ralph de Gaulle, the Earl of Norfolk, and Roger de Bretieu, Earl of Hereford, conspires to overthrow William in the revolt of the earls. The exact reason for the rebellion is unclear, but it was launched during the wedding of Ralph and a relative of Rogers, held in Exing. Another earl, Walthnorf, despite being one of William the Conqueror's favourites, was also involved and some Bretons were ready to offer their support. Ralph also requested Danish aid. William the, Conqueror, William the Conqueror remained in Normandy while his men in England subdued the revolt. Roger was unable to leave his stronghold in Hereford because of efforts by Wolfstan, the Bishop of Worcester, and Ethelwig, the Abbot of Eversham. Ralph was bottled up in Norwich Castle by the combined efforts of Odo, that is Count Odo, and Geoffrey Constance's uh, Quartuses, Richard Fitzgibbet, and William de Warn. Norwich was besieged and eventually surrenders. We don't know how long the siege took, and Ralph goes into exile. Meanwhile, the Danish king's brother, Canute, had finally arrived in England with a fleet of plus 200 ships, but he was too late to assist Norwich, who had already surrendered. The Danes then did some brief raiding along the coast and uh, returned home. William the Conqueror did not return to England until 1075 to deal with the Danish threat and the aftermath of the rebellion, instead celebrating Christmas at Winchester. Roger and Wolfnoff were kept in prison where Wolfnoff was executed in May 1076. By that time William had returned to the continent where Ralph was continuing the rebellion from Brittany. And that basically was the end of rebellion within William the Conqueror's reign. It really is quite interesting because William the Conqueror
Uh, it really is quite interesting because William the Conqueror, I suppose, would have expected that once he had defeated the English relatively decisively at Hastings, that would have been the end. And it simply wasn't the case. There was his, his whole reign, William the Conqueror's reign, was basically all about rebellion. So, um, William never really got to experience peace in England. Uh, and he then goes on to, to fight in France. Alrighty, guys, here we go. That was my video on the Anglo-Saxon uprisings in England post-1066. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.